Teaching While Queer is a podcast for LGBTQIA plus teachers, administrators, and well, anyone who works in academia to share their stories. Hi, my name is Brian Stanton, a queer theater educator in San Antonio, Texas. Each week, I bring you stories from around the world centered on the experiences of LGBTQIA folks in academia. Thank you for joining me on this journey and enjoy Teaching While Queer. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Teaching While Queer. I am your host, Brian Stanton, and I have the privilege to be talking with a Northern California teacher, Ben Wilkinson. How are you doing, Ben? Hi, Brian. I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastic. It's beautiful uh, 105 degrees here in Texas, but the air conditioning is working, so it's a win. (laughs) Wow, that is uh, definitely hot. I think it's about... 68 where i am right now <laughs> but we had a 100 degree heat wave last week so i i feel your pain <laughs> yeah it's been wild it's been like 25 days here in san antonio luckily oh. i got the privilege of going to chicago for a week couple weeks ago so i'm i'm good i've had my mix of 70 degree weather in the summer. <laughs> nice the windy city very cool so tell me a little bit about yourself um well my name is ben and uh i'm a uh, currently a teacher and a student. Um, I'm in the music education field. I'm currently finishing my bachelor's from San Jose State University um, uh, in music education. And I'm also um, kind of doing a lot of like freelance coaching and teaching um, in the area, uh, in the Bay Area. Um, I am I have been coaching color guard, which is part of the marching band for 18 years. Um, And then I've been teaching um, general music for four years. Um, And I ended up getting this job about four years ago, uh, which kind of solidified my uh, decision to go into teaching music full time, um, where I I got to see uh, an entire elementary school from TK to five. And I got to teach them um, music. And that was life-changing and eye-opening. So I said, all right, I need to go back to San Jose State, finish my degree. Um, I dropped out of school, actually, 12 years ago uh, during the recession. And I was just on my own without support and trying to come to terms with who I was as a, a gay person. And so it was just not the best time for me to be in school. So I took a break and... Um, you know, got caught, caught up in the hustle trying to survive. I, I worked in multiple coffee shops for years. And uh, then I decided that was not what I wanted to do forever. And I really wanted to go back to my initial goal of teaching. Um, so yeah, so I'm back at San Jose State as a music major. I play the flute, um, which has been a great experience getting back into. And I also um, teach uh, different color guards. I'm kind of uh, retired at the moment. I just took my last competitive season and now I'm going into a more of a consulting role. Um, so I am helping a few different local uh, high schools around Northern California. I'm choreographing their routines for them for their competitive parade routines. And uh, I also work with this nonprofit um, group based in Fremont, California called Tri-City Band Corps, which is um, a great kind of student run operation, but they bring in some adults to help guide. And so I was the elementary band director this past summer. We actually just had our uh, final concert on Wednesday. So it's kind of a complicated question. I'm not like a full on teacher teacher just yet, Um, but I have been working with kids since I was 18 years old, right out of high school. So been at it for quite a while. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. A lot of my experience, honestly, I had 10 years as a private lessons music teacher prior to jumping into the classroom. And I think that there's so much validity in that experience and whatnot. And you've got the best of like all worlds. I mean, you worked, you know, pre-K all the way through high school at this point. Uh, yeah. in different different areas, which is so neat because you've ran the gamut of basically academia with the exception of higher education. Um, and many of us don't get to do that. Uh, I jumped into high school teaching thinking that I was going to teach middle school and I ended up at a high school and I don't ever want to go teach middle school or elementary at this point. Um, so <laughs> I love that you've got such a, a wide variety um, in your experience because it's so unique. And I think that's I think that's the joy of uh, sharing everyone's stories is just hearing how different our experiences are. Um, 
but we're gonna we're gonna time travel, if you will, and I would love to learn more about your experience as a queer student. Um, did you grow up in Northern California? I did. Yeah, I grew up in a um, small town in the East Bay called Benicia. It's like thirty thousand people. It's not like super tiny, but it's not big at all. <laughs> Definitely more of like a small town. Everybody knows everybody kind of vibe. Um, which is unique for the Bay Area. <laughs> Absolutely. So what was it like uh, growing up as a queer student um, in a, a small town vibe? Um, you know, it was very much like similar to stories that I've heard from like friends who grew up in like the Midwest. Um, you know, the town itself is pretty split, like ideologically, um, pretty evenly. So it's, it's weird because there's like a, a it's it's a cool little like not cool but it's like a mix of like there's like a little art community there and there's a huge like glass blowing community and like um there's definitely like a liberal vibe in some ways but there's also like a very conservative like undertone and it's kind of like it's it's always kind of been very back and forth and so socially though it was very difficult to grow up um not just specifically for me, but like for anyone of any kind of um, minority or, um, you know, different socioeconomic class. Um, it, it was it was very, very difficult. Uh, you know, kids are going through the halls, you know, screaming fag at you or sorry, the F word. Or, <laughs> um, and it was not fun at all. Um, and so I stayed closeted through high school. You know, I didn't even think it was an option for me to be gay, which is funny because like before I actually moved to Benicia in eighth grade. Um, before that, I grew up in Concord and, you know, I was around queer people my whole life um, and never thought anything bad of it. Um, but I just thought, okay, it can't be for me. Like, I can't do this. And a big part of that was like, because I wanted to be a teacher and I hadn't seen much queer representation um, from teachers. And I didn't think that could be a thing. You know, this is me as like a, a young kid. I knew I wanted to teach yeah. since kindergarten. Um, so <laughs> I always kind of went into that, that mindset. And I think um, that made everything really difficult for me. I think, you know, just... I was always stuck in fight or flight and trying to, you know, be in self-defensive mode, trying to blend in and uh, not be seen. I definitely like was effeminate and flamboyant, but only in like places where I felt safe. Uh, and so it, it was, it was interesting. It was definitely a struggle um, as a student for sure. And like, as a band student, it was cool because I found definite like refuge there. It was, it was the like gathering place for queer people. Um, we didn't know that at the time because <laughs> <laughs> none of us <laughs> had been out yet. And and then a few, a bunch of girls came out in, in high school and we we're like, what the heck? Like, where are all these lesbians coming from? And, um, but it was great. And that, like that they felt safe to do that. And there were also, um, uh, we had probably like two or three trans men as well. And, you know, they got the brunt of the bullying and from my band teacher too. And it, it was just like, you know, whether it was like a, a how, how you acted as a person or like what you wanted to wear in a concert. I mean, it was just like any issue that could have been brought up, but it was brought up and, and it was difficult. And I, I, you know, I know a lot of us have been in therapy and a lot of us, uh, have had to work through a lot of self-hatred and internalized homophobia. And um, it's been a challenge for sure. And, um, but that also kind of lit the fire under me to want to continue my education and create an experience where other people could feel welcomed and feel like, hey, maybe school can be for me too. That's awesome. I, you're not the first person to tell me that you you delayed coming out or, or being open because you wanted to be a teacher. The lack of representation was like a real thing up until recently. Um, and I even have friends now who are like, because you have come to the school and have been so open, I feel like I can be more open. And it's really, um, it's really wild that like things have come so far, but we also oh. have these same exact like feelings in certain smaller areas of the community. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Even um, this week, I, I went and worked with a, a color guard group up in a, a very, very rural, remote town. 
and you know they only have like six kids or whatever um in their group but the cool thing is they're all queer and they all <laughs> it's like I, it was like walking in to like a magic little fairyland i was like wait all of you like none of them they're all some beautiful brand of the rainbow and it's like you know there's non-binary kids and trans kids and gay kids and lesbians and it's like everything in this small group and they're all just there for each other and you know in a town like that like i mean i had a lot of privilege where i grew up growing in the bay area because yeah i did face homophobia and things but you know not to the same extent i would have had i grown up in this town <laughs> and so i see what these kids are going through and and their struggles and you know it's really difficult even in the few days i worked with them i learned so much about their culture and how they have to protect themselves even from their parents and it's it's you know it's sad but it's like also like a glimmer of hope in that small town is that there's this place for these kids to exist and it was really special that's awesome wow you kind of went into like a little microcosm of queerness i love that <laughs> <laughs> I know it was a trip because I last I, I it's funny I worked with this group about 15 years ago I had choreographed for them and I showed up and all the it was all girls and they were all dressed in hunting camo gear and the <laughs> boyfriends sat on the side of the rehearsal in their hunting camo gear as well and stared at me as I was teaching their girlfriends choreography and I'm like oh my god are these guys gonna like jump me and I didn't mean to like jump to that conclusion but the way they were looking at me was kind of terrifying so I'm like uh, this is interesting and now it's like totally flip-flopped and become like what I feel like is a great thing about art it's become that place now for the kids who really need it and I, I just think that's awesome I agree I think the arts are so impactful for so many people when it comes to finding yourself and really figuring out who you are and it doesn't matter like gay straight trans like the arts will help you piece together the person that's inside Yes, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, it's a life changer for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, how do you think that your experience as a, as a queer student has uh, informed, informed your life as a queer teacher? Um, that's a great question. You know, and I think over time, like as I've become more self-aware and as I've, you know, gone through more as an adult, um, I've definitely evolved in that. I think, you know, when I was young, I was still kind of halfway in the closet and I wanted to be that for the kids, but I was still like trying to hide it, which, I mean, I wasn't hiding it, but you know, I thought I <laughs> <laughs> there's a, a margin of success in there somewhere. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, and then, you know, it's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I totally lost my train of thought. Um, can you, you, <laughs> you were in the closet and and so now as an out educator, how, how has it informed your your teaching and your your experience working with students? Oh, duh. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, now as an out educator I, and um, going through the experiences that I went through, I definitely think I go through my teaching experience through a lens of like compassion and I try to you know and humanity and I try to see everyone for where they're at and to respect them for where they're at and I think you know that that really plays a huge role into how I teach you know yes there's standards and there's um you know benchmarks you need to meet and whatnot but if you can't do that through the lens of humanity then what's the point of achieving those standards because those kids are, aren't, aren't going to be successful in the ways you think they're going to be at the end of the day. And they're going to have to go back and unlearn so much stuff. So, you know, I think it's like, just like the generations before us, it's like trying to learn from the mistakes that I witnessed and experienced as a student and trying to, you know, go forward with my best foot um, for the students that are coming after me and trying, you know, my best to unlearn my traumas and, and not project that onto them and to give them the opportunity to really grow and excel not only as queer students or regular students or whatever but just as people in general and to realize you know at the end of the day we're whether we like it or not we're all connected and Absolutely. it's a beautiful thing if we let it be i agree um 
what is it, what is it like for you, especially because you you held off on coming out? So what is it like working with queer students? You had that whole gang uh, of uh, the queer microcosm, so you get a lot of experience working with with students who are already identifying as queer so young. Yeah, um, you know, I think it has been a generally a positive experience. Um, I've had kids come out to me in places that they never felt safe coming out to other people before. Um, I've had kids, you know, ask me what to do next in their life because they're struggling in their young adulthood and they knew that I had been through that. So they would reach out to me and be like, how do I get through this? I know you've been through this. And so even beyond the classroom, I think um, just letting kids know that, hey, I'm one of you, like I've gone through these things. Um, there's a way you can do it and still be happy and and live your best life for yourself. And I'm trying my best to model that for you. And I hope that, you know, those students can take something away from that and s feel seen and um, just understand that they're people too and maybe feel less othered. Absolutely. I, lo I love that idea of less othered um, and just giving people a space to just realize that you're a person and you get to you get to be the person regardless of every other person's hood personhood. Um, I love that. And, and kind of getting into that, how do you interact with students who might not, I don't know, agree, quote unquote, with the LGBT community? There's such a huge divide right now. Of, I agree or I disagree with that, even though sometimes it's just a fact of life. Right. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and my job is to fight for unity through it all. And it's like, you know, in my personal life, I experience so much division and hatred, even if it's not directly at my face, you know, just opening your phone and there's always a news article of something new or someone getting gay bashed or whatever. It's honestly, it's terrifying. It is. Um, and so to work with students who have those ideology ideologies, it can be pretty scary too. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, my perspective on students is that they're children, regardless of their age, you know, like I was a child until I was 25. Let's be real. The brain doesn't develop until it's 28. Honestly. So it's like, I can't fault those kids for what they've learned. And, you know, if hatred and bigotry is taught to them, that's not their fault. And that doesn't mean that they're not in the wrong. And it doesn't mean that I won't stand up for bullies, because best believe I will call someone out if I hear anything racist, anything sexist, homophobic, like I will not tolerate that in the classroom. It's my number one. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you know, like I said, I try to meet kids where they're at. And I'm like, okay, like, first of all, my main focus is on the curriculum at the end of the day. And I have a job to do there. And my job is to be able to work with people of all backgrounds, all shapes, sizes, colors, races, everything. And to bring them together, especially in band, like our job is to create music together. Um, and that's one of the things I've always loved about the activity is that it does bring together left and right. It does, whether you like it or not, or agree with the person playing their instrument next to you, you know, band has a huge draw of people. And a lot of those people are really in the middle of things. So <laughs> like they just want to be friends with everyone else. And, and that's kind of what holds the glue together. And then the people on the fringe find connections with people on the other fringe because, hey, we might disagree with this, but look how passionate we both are. And look how much we can both connect on, on our vibrancy in life. You know, like I think it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have like a solid answer. This is exactly how I deal with it. What I will say is that I look at everybody like they're humans before they're politicians. And people have flawed views all the times, myself included. And I have to constantly keep myself in check and be like, oh, this was a really racist thing I learned. I need to not do that ever again. Or... Mm -hmm. You know, this is a way I'm being homophobic. What? I'm gay? Like, how am I doing that? Oh, well, I am. So I need to figure it out and stop it. You know, and there's, we all have those things that um, are imperfect or mean or whatever judge, judgmental. And I think it's really about being self-aware and like overcoming your own personal biases and like 
or being aware of them at least and being able to realize, okay, like this person doesn't think I should have any rights, but Mm -hmm. they're also 15 and (laughs) they love to twirl their flag as much as the person next to them who went to the Black Lives Matter rally, (laughs) you know, and at the end of the day, we're, we're all so much more similar than we are different. And I just hope that I, and I believe that especially like arts and band is a place where people can learn from each other and learn to draw respect for each other. And some of them will change their views as well and become more open-minded. You know, I was friends with a ton of Republicans in high school and I tried really hard to stay in the middle. Um, But a lot of times I won them over and they were like, you're right. Like gay people should be able to get married and, and whatnot. So it really like it's hard to generalize like against people you know liberals are very just as much uh, as guilty as stereotyping other people as 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 they are of us granted you know we're not the ones you know trying to vote against human rights so i think there is that bias also but um i i also uh think my job as a teacher whether i like it or not is to remain neutral and to primarily be an educator for those students and to help guide them. And, you know, like I said, I will always put compassion and empathy first, and that's my job to teach those students. If they can learn that, then they'll be able to play music just fine. If they can't learn that, they can't play music. It won't be music. So, um, yeah, I guess (laughs) that's my long-winded answer on that. (laughs) I love it. I think that there's something to be said about, I mean, we've been taught for ages i feel like it's been repeated that music is this universal language and you have the privilege of teaching that to students and i think that teaching kindness and compassion along with music i think that that is it goes hand in hand um and it's such a powerful statement and reminder just how important the arts music um is for students um so I think it's great. It's a unifying idea. And you even started with that. Uh, first of all, I start with unity. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's just, it's powerful. And it's fun for those of us who teach the arts, right? Like we have this this uh, extra level of we get to shape humans just a tiny bit more than maybe a core subject teacher. Like I teach theater and right. I've seen how my students learn empathy because they played a character who had different circumstances. Um, and I've seen how listening to certain types of music or performing certain types of music has impacted or changed the emotional range of my students. I mean, it's an exercise. Sometimes we just put on warm up music and we move our bodies and, and yeah. music could be melancholy and it could be happy and it's going to change the vibe. I love of- it. <laughs> of the, of the students and so i think that the, it's just powerful and we're so lucky that we get to teach the arts <laughs> oh my gosh yes yes definitely it's, it's such a privilege i mean it does as much as it feels like work and it drains my soul and i'm like thank god there's summers off in between but <laughs> <laughs> it's beyond i mean i spent my 20s in corporate america and i will take teaching any day over anything else <laughs> agreed i had the same experience of working with <laughs> several corporations and i'm like i just love my little classroom and then i get to not be around those people for three months and then i get to come back and and be like yes we're a family again right uh, but also take my space you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> have time to be an adult too for sure yeah, absolutely <laughs> Um, so given that you've worked in a wide variety of spaces from like conservative areas to more liberal areas, what has your experience overall been like working with administration and parents? You know, it's actually, I have had a 99% positivity rate, I think, in my (laughs) experiences with administrations and parents. Typically, my jobs have been like more of coaching roles. So I haven't really been directly involved. Usually the band director is my boss. So I don't really work with the administrations very often. Um, but Fair. I ha- I also have worked with administrations. When I was a general ed- uh, elementary music specialist for two years in Walnut Creek, um, I had a, a great uh, principal. She was very supportive of me and my goals and um, 
guided me like through and was like, let me know what you need. I'm here for you. Um, and, and that was a, a interesting, an interesting place to work because it was liberal, but it was also very white. So it's like, it still was problematic in its own right, but like it wasn't, it, or it was, but it like, it was okay to work. Like there were a couple other gay men there that worked. So I was like, okay, like I'm not completely alone, but it didn't feel like a hundred percent like supportive and diverse. Um, but the administration would would really support me in my endeavors. And I never had any problem with being like gay. Like my principal worked for Cheer SF, which is a big um, cheerleading team because she was a cheerleader in high school and, and whatnot. And so she was very supportive. Um, and she even tried to start a pride parade. Well, I guess a parents wanted to start a little pride parade at the elementary school because we had fourth and fifth graders that were coming out and both as queer and trans and it was awesome. I love um, it. Yeah. Love it so much that people are so empowered to be themselves at a younger age. Right? I'm like, I can't even imagine. Like, and it's so cool to see. I'm just like so happy for these kids. Like, like, wow, you know yourself so well. And you're just like, this is who I am. And I'm like, good for you. Like, I love that <laughs> you're in a place where you can do that. That's so freaking amazing. And so, so much for how much better in some ways the future is going to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Have you had any, uh, had much experience working with parents? I know that you've been more on a consultant. Uh, uh, oh, no, I, and, and definitely <laughs> like as a color guard instructor, I understand like the dynamic is the band director is kind of the point of contact. But um, I know that, you know, color guard could be a tight knit group and you're, you know, the leader of that. So, um, what has it been like working with parents? You know, generally, my parents have been really supportive of me. Um, I've only had one school, and ironically, it was the high school I went to. I went back to teach there. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's the only school I've ever had an issue with a parent, and it was because I didn't give their kid a solo. And I'm like, oh, okay. How well, dare you? <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. Like, that's a whole <laughs> podcast. But um, <laughs> my experience going back to my high school teaching as a queer person would not recommend to anyone ever <laughs> by the way because you encounter so much ptsd of like just walking down the halls you all these flashbacks and things if you didn't have like a fabulous out experience in high school i would not recommend going back to your high school because yeah, i like, definitely like, like internalized homophobia all over again <laughs> it's <was> crazy <laughs> i've been thinking about that recently because i did try to connect with former teachers who let's say we're like, they weren't supportive, but they weren't not supportive. They were kind of just like neutral. Um, uh -huh. And I just had like the worst time trying to connect with them. It just felt like uh, it felt wrong. And it brought back a lot of things from high school that I probably forgot about for good reason. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> that right? was homophobia. Like, and I just didn't know. Um, totally. Totally. And so the idea of going back there to try to teach, even though, you know, I grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles and you oh, know, okay, yeah. Southern California is supposed to be very liberal and whatnot, but those suburbs have Suburb. a way of <laughs> yeah. being conservative. Absolutely. And, and it's funny because I look at even like my 20 year class reunion was last weekend and I've seen posts about things and and there's literally myself and one other person representing the queer community still. And I'm just like, Oh my God, wow, how did, how did that happen? And it could just be that other people have disappeared and they don't want to associate, which is fine because I'm kind of <laughs> in the same vein. Like, yeah, I'm on this Facebook page, but like, I literally have no desire to talk to some of you. Right. Um, <laughs> but it was just wild to me thinking about like, I, I'm a queer person, I'm married, I have children, and I'm the only one showing that representation. Um, wow. Is, is so interesting and there's so many of those folks still live at home or right. that, that community. So I'm like, oh, like if I, if I moved back there and I tried to teach, I would hate it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I know that it's definitely what I experienced. <laughs> and it wasn't the kids that I directly taught, you know, is the environment overall. Like the kids I taught were great. Like, I don't want to say that, like, it was them at all. It was just reliving that experience itself was like, 
really difficult. And then that made that difficult for me to be a good teacher. And that was what was really hard for me. It's like, I'm, I'm used to teaching at a certain level here. And I'm like, okay, now I'm having anxiety attacks all the time. <laughs> I'm having all these breakdowns. I'm in therapy, like all the time now, this is not working. So I did eventually leave. Um, but I went, I went back one more time because they were desperate need for an instructor and uh, last year and but I didn't do it alone I taught with a friend so I was like I'll just come in and help and that was better I could handle it but I, I was like all right like I need to not teach at my own school and let's keep the past in the past <laughs> absolutely it's weird how like uh you can be traumatized without realizing you're traumatized uh and then yeah. and then you walk into a space and all of a sudden you have PTSD and you're like what what is yeah. happening <laughs> It's a trip. And then I'm like, oh, it worked through everything. And then it's like, nope, there's no <laughs> more there. <laughs> All right. I'll see my therapist on Thursday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I think, you know, take on that note, like taking care of your mental health as an educator is so important. It's Agreed. just, and, and, and no one does it. Everyone's, because we're educators, we're so focused on the kids, we forget about ourselves. And it's like, no, you have to take that time for yourself, even if it's five minutes a day and, you know, ground, get grounded and, you know, remember why you're doing what you're doing and see your family and make time for yourself. Like if you don't do those things, it just becomes this spiral and you burn out and no one wants that. It's not fun. And then the kids are having a miserable experience and that's the worst for them because yeah. that's their, their perspective of the future. It's wild because I think because of education, I have more healthy habits when it comes to mental health because it was the stress of a school year that got me into therapy. And then I started doing yoga and meditating and all of these things to just kind of balance out the amount of stress that I deal with. Yeah, I probably have should have been doing this for the last 20 years <laughs> in corporate life, but like it was finally the push that I needed and I'm so much better for it. Like taking those steps for mental health has made me like a better person as well as a teacher. And it yeah. just kind of, it's, it's been an eye opening experience because I didn't realize how much I needed these things until I was pushed to the edge of burnout. Um, yeah. and really had to have a talk with myself about like how you can get through this. Can't do it all on your own, obviously. Right, right. And I mean, you know, it's hard. It's hard to overcome that stigma. I mean, I was even raised around therapists my whole life. And I still was like, Oh, no, I can work this out on my own. And <laughs> I'll be fine. And well, but then your trauma projects on other people, whether you realize it or not. And especially in a teaching role, that's just really, really harmful. Um, and you know, I've experienced that as an educator, like when I was younger, I was totally <laughs> insecure and like, super rude to the kids and like we need to be clean we need to da, 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 we need to win and now i'm like no like absolutely not like that's the last thing on my list like i want to make sure you guys are okay i want to make sure we're having a good time and still learning like because they can't they learn better when they're in a better mental health headspace just like we teach better when we're in a better headspace so if i'm in that headspace the kids are going to model that and I think that's like the crucial part of teaching is these kids are literally modeling the behaviors we are showing them every single day. Yes, absolutely. There's so much that happens at home, but there's also so much that they learn in the classroom just from observation. Yeah. Um, and definitely. being around different types of people. Right, right. And I mean, I see these kids like you do in theater, I'm sure for four years. And it's mm -hmm. like, you see them grow into adult humans over that time. And they trust you and they want your guidance because you're teaching them what they love. And it's like, you know, I keep my boundary very clear with them. I never like cross that, but I would be supportive of them if they're having a bad day and like, you know, try to show them that it does get better. Like I'll never forget that Trevor project campaign. It gets better. Like I, when I was younger and a coach and like, I was to have a bad mental health day, my color guard staff, like I was the head instructor and they'd all be like, Ben, it gets better. It's okay. <laughs> like, yeah. and I'm like, okay, you're right. You're right. You're right. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And the but, Trevor project's like, yes. This podcast is not sponsored by the Trevor project. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, name drop. <laughs> this is free marketing. Uh, <laughs> that's so funny. Um, but I agree with you. And uh, you know, one of my favorite things as an educator, especially because I do get that experience like you do, where I'm working with students for multiple years, is 
is the transformation that happens between January and May of the senior year. Like these kids totally transform into a young adult, you know, We've already talked about it. The brain doesn't finish developing until you're 27. You're still kind of a child during this time period. But, like, you see after those college applications have all been turned in and it's just a matter of waiting, all of a sudden they get to focus on who am I now? Yeah. Because this is ending. And it is such an interesting transformation. And for for any parents or teachers who are listening who have had, had this experience, like, it's wild to see, right? It's 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 the most magical thing i think when i get to the second semester every year i'm just watching waiting to see when's the moment where they start looking like a young adult yes oh my gosh yes that's why i love high school so much is because you know it's like we're like their last little like gate to pass through into adulthood and it's like we can give them our their last little life advice and and you know kind of like and help like if they're having like help with their perspective too because like a lot of kids will get you know torn down and beat up all the hormones and everything and get depressed and it's like but if you can help like guide a student to channel that into positivity and into you know self-love and acceptance like they can do that it's still they're still young enough where they can change their attitude and perspective on life and it's like i mean we're no one's too young or too old to do that but they to be able to do that right before they like go into the real world and just be like, okay, you're going to be good. Like, I already know you're just like all my kids. I already assume like positive intent. I'm like, you're going to be a good kid. But like seeing them that in that last transformation, when they finally like shape into who they are and you're like, wow. And every time I'm just like, you've become such an amazing person. Like, it's just beautiful to see. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful. It's one of my favorite things, honestly. Um, so we're winding down. So I've just got two couple of questions for you. Um, one is why, why education? You could do anything and especially in the arts, like there's so many things we could be doing, but why, why be an educator? That's an interesting question. I would just say like my personal passion, I love art. I love playing music. My passion is teaching my what i really love is seeing somebody understand something for the next time or for the first time and just getting that excitement like oh my gosh i was able to do it and make that connection um that's what i live for is is just being able to help um i knew i wanted to be a teacher since i was like in kindergarten though i i don't know why like I just remember starting kindergarten and I loved my teacher and I was like, that's what I want to do with my life. I was like, I had a pretty not great home life as a kid. So like I'd go to my kindergarten class and my teacher was nice to us. And I was like, what, what is this? Like, and (laughs) I was like, wait, there's a place that can be great. And I think that really shaped my perspective of what school could be. Um, I love that. And I love that you went, you were in elementary education previously. And so you kind of got that you got to be that person. That's so awesome. Yeah, it was fun. I, I think I do want to teach high school because it's a lot of energy and performativeness that for me personally just is draining, but I loved working with the kids. It's really fun age. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things I've always wanted to be a teacher probably since I was in middle school, but I thought I was going to be a band director. So the fact that I'm teaching oh, yeah. is like a whole, like, it's not really a left turn because I still teach the arts, but like, uh, we have a common educator. Um, my freshman year of high school, I was in band uh, with Miss Hollinger. Uh, she was my band director, and she teaches at San Jose State, where you are you're getting your bachelor's. Um, and she just like was pivotal in my kind of upbringing. She was the person that made me feel safe, and I only had her for a year. Um, if you go back and listen to the first episode of the podcast, she is the person I'm talking about when I explain my coming out story. Um, oh my gosh. And she's been so impactful that she's literally the only teacher that I still communicate with from that school, even though, um, you know, I had her for all of six months <laughs> before <laughs> she went on to pursue her master's and eventual doctorate. Um, and so that just that impact of teachers is so amazing how it can just stick with you and to know that you had that experience as a kindergartner is just like wonderful like what an amazing thing for your kindergarten teacher to have been able to do for you like what a gift 
<laughs> yeah, shout out to Miss Grace. If if she's still alive, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, <laughs> it was a long time. Yeah, it's, <laughs> but, it's been a while, yeah. Uh, but that's funny because yeah, Dr. Hollinger is uh, my number one educator as well, and and she, you know, when I dropped out of school, she's the one who prodded me for 12 years and was like, "Please come back, please come back, please come back." And I was like, I, "I'm not good enough. Like, I can't do it. I don't have money." Blah blah blah. And then finally, like the pandemic hit, I was like, "Okay, I'm coming back." And she was like, "No," and I was like, "Yes." <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's all because of her, really. Like, I mean, she was the first person in college when you know I had to threaten a lawsuit to be in the marching band because they didn't want boys in the color guard at at San Jose State 12 what? years ago. Yes. I was like, okay, well, that's kind of illegal. And then the dude was like, okay, well, I'll see you at band camp then. I'm like, okay, great. Thanks. Like, that yeah. It, wild. And so I felt really freaking alienated at that school. Like I, it was a huge reason why I dropped out. And um, I was like, you know, Diana was, Dr. Hollinger was trying to get me to come back and, and she's like, come back, come back. And I'm like, I'm not going back to San Jose State. Absolutely not. Like, I love her, but, like, I didn't want that homophobic experience again. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, it's changed. I promise. I promise. Blah, blah, blah. It's different now. And I was like, mm. so I met with her. We talked for, like, four hours. And, and I was like, okay, I have to go back. Like, if anything, I'll get to, like, learn more from her because she's just freaking phenomenal. And she just leads with such a passion and, a, a, a like, a fiery passion for for justice and for kindness and for empathy. And it, it, it changed my whole perspective of what music could be because I got the polar opposite in high school where it was, we were undefeated and totally obsessed with winning and <laughs> it was crazy. So, um, you know, she's absolutely changed my life and I will forever be in debt and grateful for, to her. That's cool it's that we have. It's so crazy comp. how many people she's impacted too, because one, the band director, I think he's now the, the head band director there, um, went to high school with me or graduated the year oh, before Craig. I did, Craig. And he um he was like influential on me as well because like he was leading band camp and, and doing all this stuff and he was in choir and like I learned like, oh, I could do all of these things. And then now he's back working with her there and his wife oh, yeah. and like his wife played my mom in Tommy and oh. like we we're like we're so connected and it's just wild because those people are like the important people and the fact that they're all connected together is, is so cool. Um, oh, totally. And the fact that she's still making that impact on other people, like she hounded you for 12 years and you went back to oh, school. Yeah. Like how cool is that? Everyone else, my mom, anyone else who kind of helped raise me as a kid is like, you're just not meant for college. You're too poor. You don't understand how to work hard enough to make it all happen. So you're just not meant. And then, I believed that, you know, and, and then she, she changed my mind and was like, no, we need queer educators, please. And I'm like, okay, all right. I, I'm already working with kids. Like it's what I've always wanted to do. I just didn't feel like I had a, a pathway to do it because of financial things and whatnot. Luckily I have a really supportive partner who's been helping keep down the fort while I'm in school. <laughs> so it's made a freaking huge impact as well. Awesome. That's fantastic. Final question for you. Uh, what is a bit of advice that you would give to someone who is uh, wanting to become a teacher, but a little bit concerned about coming out? I mean, that's an experience that you had. So what would be, what would be your advice to that person? You will be the best version of your teacher self if you are the most authentic version of your teacher self. If you're holding something in, your kids will realize it and it will make your job harder. And not just your kids will realize it, but it'll make their lives harder. Because when we are not able to accept who we are, it means there's things that we don't like about ourselves. And it means that we see the world through that lens of the things we don't like about ourselves and the things we do. But it's crucial that we don't project that energy onto children. And mm -hmm. it's the hardest part about teaching. And it is the most important part about teaching because it determines what the younger generation will feel about us, our country, our world, and how they're going to go about their adult lives to keep it going or not. That's beautiful. Oh, I love that. Well, 
It has been so great talking with you and getting to know you. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with me. And I wish you so much luck as you finish your bachelor's program um, and jump into the world of band directing. (laughs) Thank you so much. It was an honor to talk with you. I hope I helped. I hope you have great successes with this podcast. I think it's amazing. And just, you know, if this is something I had 15 years ago, I think it would have really helped me for sure. And I'm grateful to be a part of it. So thanks so much for this conversation. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Teaching While Queer. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing on your favorite RSS feed and sharing the podcast with your friends and family. New episodes will come out every other week during the school year. If you're interested in joining us on the Teaching While Queer podcast, please email us at teachingwhilequeerpodcast at gmail.com. Have a great day.